It's been about 50 days since Israel departed from Egypt. And now they're at the foot of Sinai and it's ablaze with the glory of God. Exodus 19, 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the nether part of the mount at the foot of the mount and Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. It's sort of a frightful scene uh, as we read that scripture. God is about to call Moses up upon the mountain. Serious, serious moment, and so... The Israelites uh, wash their clothes and get themselves ready, and Moses goes up to meet his God. The Ten Commandments are God's moral, righteous standards for the world. God's moral, righteous standards for the world. for every nation, for every race, for all believers, and for all non-believers, and all infidels, and all God-haters, and all people. This is God's standard of moral righteousness for them also. Now God is extremely narrow-minded. For he is convinced that he is the one and the only God. He's absolutely convinced about it. And he expects us to agree with him. And he also is convinced that his way is the only way. Extremely narrow-minded. God knows nothing about these concepts of freedom to worship whatever and whenever and however, if ever, we choose. He knows nothing about those, those concepts. He knows uh, he's totally, uh, he has no tolerance for other religious points of view, only his own. God calls all other points of view an abomination. God is very, very narrow-minded. Freedom to worship, whatever, wherever, whenever, if ever, is a modern-day concept. And we may hold to that with a patriotic fervor. However, you'll not hear those concepts from the scripture. You may search the pages diligently, every single one of them, and you will not find this concept that God is giving you the freedom to just worship whatever God you may choose and however you may choose and not to if you choose. God's uh, mindset is so far from that. Yet that seems to be the mindset of many of us today. The Ten Commandments are divided into two parts, and uh, you know this already, the relationship of man to God, the first four uh, of the, uh, the commandments, and then from five to ten is the relationship of man to man. And then there is a threefold giving of the Ten Commandments. Uh, one is orally, and uh, that is found in Exodus 21 through 17. It's followed by various instructions uh, on the three uh, annual feasts and 
the conquest of Canaan. And then the second giving of the commandments is found in Exodus 24, 12 through the 31st chapter. And this is where God writes his words in stone with his finger. I would have loved to have seen that up close. And also in this giving of the commandments, we have the instruction on the tabernacle and the priesthood and the sacrifices. And this was the occasion where when Moses came down from the mountain, uh, he saw them at the foot of the mountain with the golden calf and the, the raucous songs and the raucous worshiping and uh, anger came up in Moses and he threw the stones to the ground and broke them. Don't you, don't you know that Moses looked just like Charlton Heston? Don't you, he sounded just like him too. I just, I'm sure that that's so. It'd be such a disappointment to get to heaven and see Moses and he sounded like Truman Capote. That would be so disappointing. <clears throat> and then the third giving of the commandments is found in Exodus 34, 1, and then the 28th verse, and the 29th verse, and Deuteronomy 10, 4. And uh, this is where God writes again the commandments in stone. And if you want to get a good uh, summary of that, if you have the Schofield Bible, turn to page 95, and it really gives a good summary of those three giving of the Ten Commandments. So we come to Exodus 20. And the Ten Commandments given orally to Moses, the one that we're most familiar with. So, here we are. Let us call all the nations together. All the government leaders of the world and all the religious leaders, all the gurus of the world. And all the, let's call all the members of the United Nations and have them sit right here if there's enough room for them. And uh, let us call all the Baptists and the Methodists and the Lutherans and the Catholics and all of Christianity and all of those who think they are of Christianity. Let us call them all together. Let us call all those who adhere to Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam and Confucianism and all the isms and the ites. Let us call them all together, all the Mormons, even the satanic worshipers. Let us call all the demons and let them sit down. And all of those who indulge in the black arts, call them, sit them down and let them hear what God has to say. Exodus 22. He says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, these commandments, of course, were given to Israel, but certainly they are for all mankind. God would have all men to follow him, uh, not just Israel. And then we find the first commandment, Exodus 20, third verse, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God is saying, all other gods, imagine this, all other gods out there in the countries of the world that people worship so fervently, God is saying, they're false. They are false. Imagine that. It just sort of makes cold chills run up and down our spines to hear something like that. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, he says. Makes us, makes us really shiver. But don't get mad at the messenger, for it is God who is speaking, and he is the one who says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Entirely, politically, incorrect, absolutely. And God is being very insensitive uh, to all foreign gods and all foreign teachings all around the world. Then Jesus said it this way, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and Him only 
shalt thou serve. And then the second verse says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now, this does not uh, forbid the art of sculpturing, the art of painting lovely paintings and in the art of photography, certainly this is not uh, forbidding that. It says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image uh, to fall down to worship them. That's the idea. Not to worship them. Not to bow down to them. There's a little of that going on. Maybe we should say there's a lot of that going on around the world today. In town and out of town and in the, in the jungles and the, wherever you go, you will find something that a man has made and he's bowing down to it. God says that is an abomination. And then the third commandment, uh, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Friends, God's word or God's name is not a curse word. And it's not a by word. And I know when you're preaching, you're not supposed to get too personal about yourself. But this just goes to the goes to the heart of what we're talking about. The name of God. Years ago, when I was going to school, uh, I could sing. I could sing pretty well. In fact, they gave me a scholarship. So when folks would call into the school, churches call in, the school, can you send someone out? Uh, I was obligated to go because they were paying some of the bill. And, and so I would go and I said, I've sung in so many of the churches in town. I've sung at Freeway when it was, it was different. It was different. It was years. I mean, it was back when the dinosaurs roamed. It was a long time ago. But I say that simply to say that was the, the love of my life. I, I sung more than I preached, and I enjoyed it so much. And I was teaching and preaching at the same time, and I came home from school one day, and uh, Bob, my boy, had not done a certain chore that he should have done, and I mentioned it to him. It had been a hard day at school. And... Uh, he sassed me back, which was unusual for him. And I just want to tell you, I'm so sorry to say that. A preacher of the gospel, singer of gospel songs at that time, and I used the name of God in vain as I spoke to my boy very loudly. And I remember Bob saying, Dad, your voice. And I knew what he meant because I could feel something. And I have not been able to sing very well since that time. Because I knew better that holy, holy, sacred name of God. You do not take it in vain. And God says that he will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. 
The name of the Lord, the psalmist says, praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. And also, he says, holy and reverent is his name. And Isaiah, in Isaiah 57, 15, says, high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. What do you say about the name of God? Do you whisper it with reverence and shout it with joy? Do you protect it? You don't use it as a curse word, do you, men? You don't want to do that. That's a precious name. That's a precious name. Listen to the warning again. The Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The Bible says that we are to fear God. This is a good place for us to start fearing God and to uh, consider what he is saying. Then the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, nor uh, Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maid servant, manservant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Even the animals were given a day of rest according to these ten commandments, the seventh day, the day of rest. It was the custom of the time established by the Jews uh, that donkeys, which rested one day a week in their labors, were allowed then to travel 30 miles a day. And also it was established that donkeys who were driven to work every day of the week, they were restricted to only 15 miles a day. So someone has figured this up. I hope they're right. So you lose 75 miles of travel each week by working your donkey every day. And you have a sick, seedy-looking donkey in the bargain. And you gain 3,900 miles of travel time uh, in a year if you go according to the Ten Commandments and only six in seven days work and you end up with a nice sleek looking donkey so handle your donkeys well <clears throat> but he who made man and donkey knew what was good for both of them so God made provisions for both man and donkey in the Ten Commandments now the Sabbath the seventh day commemorates the completed action act the completed act of creation the sabbath was never a day of worship it was a day of rest and when uh, jesus rose from the dead the first day of the week the early christians set that day as a day of worship it was not eclipsing the sabbath Therefore, it was not the Sabbath, and the Sabbath never was a day of worship. Now, just a few things to contrast that may help on the Sabbath, and then we'll move right on. Here are some contrasts that might help. The Sabbath was the seventh day of the week. Our worship day is Sunday, the first day of the week. Two entirely different days. The Sabbath observes God's completion of creation, as mentioned, and Sunday observes that Christ rose from the dead, therefore we worship him. One represents completed creation, the other represents completed redemption. Two, two different things we're talking about. On the seventh day, God rested. On Sunday, Christ was ceaselessly active. The resurrection, and then the appearing to all of the different people, constantly on the move and active, ceaselessly active. In the New Testament, the Sabbath is not presented as a day to be, to be observed. It's presented as a type of rest. 
of the believer in Christ Jesus. It's not even mentioned to observe. It's just given to us as this type of rest that we have in Christ. We cease from our labors, for it is complete in Him. It's a beautiful, beautiful image. And then the fifth commandment, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. I remember my parents, I believe, honored my grandparents. Uh, we lived in Springville, Pennsylvania, in a, in a lovely old farmhouse. I still dream of it. I hear the rain on the tin roof. I smell the air around that uh, countryside. It's uh, just, it's with me all the time. It had a, had a basement, a dirt floor with a vat in the bottom that the spring uh, dripped into. There were frogs that sat around on the vat. We drank that water. It had an upstairs and it had a, a main, stair, a main uh, portion of the house, an upstairs and then an attic. Big house. And uh, my grandparents, six months of the year, would come and live with us in this lovely farmhouse. And it was, I, I have memories of it. I see my grandfather coming down the stairs in the morning for breakfast, fully attired in suit and tie and vest, with the, 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 the watch with the chain and going from one pocket to the other. And this is the way he dressed. I mean, this was, this was the proper thing to do, I guess, at that time. I still have those images. And I remember my grandparents there. I remember my parents honored them by having them stay there. And then the other six months, they lived in another beautiful place, uh, Pines Lake, New Jersey, with my uncle. But the honor. They honored the parents. And uh, that's a... That's, a, that's a, a commandment with a promise. Listen to the promise. That thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Honor your parents. Honor your parents. Speak well of them. And then the sixth commandment says, Thou shalt not kill. Do no murder. However, there are citations, Romans uh, 13.4 and in other places, uh, that gives the government the right to kill uh, evil men, to put to death evil men. But our whole world is out of order on this sixth commandment from the mafia to private individuals uh, to the nations of the world. We settle our problems by killing one another. We train to kill and to kill quickly and effectively. <clears throat> we started out doing it and we still are doing it after all of these thousands of years during which time God has said thou shalt not kill. We haven't been able to find out how to put him on the throne and his righteous standards to rule in our lands. Therefore, we are as we are. And then the seventh commandment says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. In uh, 1623, Baker and Lucas published a Bible in England. That was quite unusual. The printers had made a terrible, terrible mistake. They left the word not out of the seventh commandment. And so it read, thou shalt commit adultery. It was destined to become one of the most popular Bibles around. <laughs> but they, they, just, they recalled the whole edition and destroyed the whole thing. And it has come to be known as the wicked Bible. <laughs> But from God's point of view, why adultery is so exceedingly sinful from God's point of view is that the 
picture of the marriage of a man and woman together. Pictures. The relationship of the church and Christ. We are the church, the bride. And uh, how that picture is distorted when adultery enters in. And what a violent disregard for God's word. And a violent disregard for one's partner when uh, we commit adultery. This is the sick sin of our society. The heartache, the fracture of the family, the disruption in little children's lives, the financial carnage that just fills our land is enormous because men and women will not obey God's standards of righteousness. Well, someone says everyone has been doing it, and they've been doing it right from the beginning, so, you know, lighten up just a little bit. This is really the way it is. And let me uh, share with you what 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 have to say about that point of view. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's what God has to say about that. Everybody has been doing it, and they've been doing it from the beginning of time. Makes no difference. From the beginning of time, God has proclaimed, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And so mankind gets a failing grade on the subject of adultery. By the way, that, that uh, text in 1 Corinthians 6, the 11th verse goes on to say this, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And we are so grateful for that. We are so grateful for that. We once were of that crowd. Now we're of the crowd of Jesus and we want to walk in his standards of righteousness. And when we speak of God's standard of righteousness, the Ten Commandments, oh, let it be clear and I'm sure you understand that the keeping the Ten Commandments does not save us. It simply tells us we need to be saved. It does not save us. It does not keep us saved. We cannot do it. There's only one who lived such a life. And quickly, the Eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal our house. We've lived in it for a little over 50 years. It's been broken into three times now. Uh, I suppose there's probably... Put your hand up if you're, you've been broken, if you've been stolen from. Yeah. Okay, well, that's most people. I'm surprised there's some who have not been touched. How do you do that? But uh, thou shalt not steal is what God says. Wouldn't it be a wonderful society if we had a society where we didn't have to lock the doors? We didn't have to do that in the farmhouse back in Springville, Pennsylvania. That was, that was just a delight. Just walk out and walk back in. That was all there was to it. Wouldn't it be the light we didn't have to worry about our credit cards uh, being stolen, identity theft, auto theft, bank record theft. One day it's going to be in the millennium and in eternity heaven. It's going to be that way. The millennium, there'll be some crime going on, but it'll be so subdued, so subdued because Christ is reigning there with a rod of iron for a thousand years. But his standard of righteousness will be written across all the courtrooms and all of the official buildings, you can be sure. That will be a wonderful time. You know, I think we need that thousand years 
reign of Christ under his righteousness. I think we need it. I think it would be just too much of a shock for our system to go from here right into the purity of heaven. I think it would just be too much of a shock to our system because we're so used to the filth here. And it'll be wonderful for a thousand, think of it, just think of it, you have yet ahead of you a thousand years on this planet with Christ being the ruler. And his standard of righteousness will be the standard of the day. That thrills the socks off of me when I think about that. And then after we've been there a thousand years living in that kind of a climate, singing his songs and uh, worshiping him quite openly and freely and much probably better than we do now, then to boot after that, then we get a few billion years and a few billion years and a few more billion years and endless years in heaven. Believer, you have so much ahead of you, so much to look forward to. Then the ninth commandment, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. The internet today is ideally suited for the gossips that weave their webs and stir their cauldrons in the darkness of the early morning hours and destroy lives and go in the face of God who says that we should not do that. We should not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And yet they are stirring it up and stirring it up in the face of God under the name of God. How many lives have been hurt and ruined by this vicious act of bearing false witness against their neighbor. And then the tenth commandment, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, nor, thy, uh, nor covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, his maidservant, uh, nor his ox, nor his ass, or anything that is thy neighbors. And this is a, uh, oh, we are such a coveting group of people, coveting another man's wife, coveting another man's possessions, his homes. Uh, what an ugly, what an ugly thing that is. It speaks of manservants and maidservants. That would be, I might covet after that. I don't know. It would be nice to have a manservant to take care of the yard the maid servant to take care of the house. But we don't seem to have those around today. But they did in that day. We're not to covet. Look over at our neighbor and look at what they have. And the neighbor's wife. Again, it's been going on since the beginning. You know, lighten up. It's just the way the world is. But God says... Don't do it. Don't do it. The editor of a small weekly newspaper in a town in the West was hard pressed one week to find copy to put in one column. So he filled that column with the Ten Commandments without any notation at all. Just put in the Ten Commandments. And uh, three days after, a letter came into the editor and it said, Please cancel my subscription. You're getting too personal. So, with the Ten Commandments. What a different world it would be should the whole world adopt the Ten Commandments as the standard of the world. Clean speech. What would be wrong? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Clean speech. Turn your radio on, turn your TV on, and just to hear some clean, decent speech. Is it? absolutely necessary that we have the F word thrown into every sentence and God's name taken. I mean, does, is that, does that, that some literary excellence? Is that absolutely necessary? And for believers, it certainly should be something that should not appear 
in our language. Although it does. And I've heard it. And you've heard it. And I've just confessed. I did it. I, how we have to, uh, we want to honor him. We want to honor him. We want to live his standards of righteousness. Okay, let's, let's get to closing this. I want to stay once again. Keeping the Ten Commandments will not save us. It will not keep us. But they do convict us of our sins. To get God's righteousness, you have to be born again. That's how we get the righteousness of God. And we don't earn it. We don't learn it. He simply puts it to our account in heaven and counts us as righteous. That's our security. And that is, we should be thanking God every day for that because we would be hopelessly lost if we had to earn it in some way. It is put to our, we get God's count, uh, righteousness by being born again. And then after that, after God has counted us as righteous, said, you are my child, you are righteous, you cannot sin away your salvation. I have saved you for all eternity. You can take that to the bank. After God has told us that, then it should be our heart's desire to want to live the righteous life, to enter into holiness as much as we know how in our living, to obey our God, to seek His will, and to follow His will. We're not going to be perfect in it, but we'll certainly get a lot further down the road and honor our God a lot more if we start today, say, I want to live for God. I want His power within me, moving me, helping me, walking with me. So I can start learning something about righteous speech and righteous thinking and righteous acts. Learn something of holiness. What does that mean? What in the world does that mean? Holiness. Lord, teach our hearts. Teach our hearts. Teach our hearts.